topic on hand is God's desire for mercy over judgment. And have any of you ever been in a thunderstorm that you did not intend to be in, right? Uh, and you're worried now in this thunderstorm. Uh, and what are you doing? You're kind of, you're a little bit lower and you're kind of covering your head as you walk about, hoping not to be struck as you look for a place that you can get underneath until the danger passes. Some of us think of God that way. He's ready to strike me. <laughs> He's ready to judge me. In fact, this is exactly the way that I saw God before I believed in God, okay? I was quote, an atheist, but I kind of thought, actually, he's really there, and I'm scared of this. I am scared of what will happen <laughs> when God runs into me, and I know I've done some things, and you don't need to know the basis of the things that I've done, but I've done some things, and won't he then strike me down? Isn't that his desire? Isn't it his greatest desire is to judge me? Is that, is that who God is? Is he waiting to do that, okay? Well, I was just totally wrong about God's character and heart. I was just completely wrong about what he wanted for my life. And this passage, and actually the whole Bible really, God is really wanting to give us mercy and to give us love and to give us grace, to give us every good thing, to raise us up to life, not to smash us down into death. Now, actually, some people will in fact, be smashed down to death by their own choosing. That's not God's heart. And so this, this passage that we're going to look at today, we're going to talk about where it comes from and why it's in italics in just a moment, but this passage is about mercy triumphing over judgment. And this is really kind of the big theme of the Bible. In Christ, mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the big theme. This is God's heart for you. Not that you would die, but that you would be lifted up. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's why Jesus came. Now, before we dive in, we need to talk about this section of Scripture, John 8, 1 through 11. You'll notice that it is in italics. We were actually making our way through the book of John about a month ago, and I just skipped right over this section. I didn't even touch it. And I said, oh, we'll come back to this as a one-off during the summer. And so now here we are in the summer, and this is our one-off. And why did I skip over it? Here's why. The words that we read here in John, uh, they were not in the early Bible as such, okay? They were not in the earliest version of the Bibles. The earliest manuscripts that we had did not contain this story at all. <laughs> now, this is an exceedingly rare occurrence as far as things in the Bible, and I hope that you understand this. This is a very unusual thing. Let me give you an example. We have thousands of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, thousands of them, and they have lots of very minor differences, lots and lots and lots of them, between these different manuscripts that we have. We have lots and lots of Johns, we have lots of Marks, we have lots of all of these books in the Bible, and they have these minor differences. What kind of minor differences are we talking about? Well, like capitals, capital letters versus not capital letters, words uh, that are in a different order. In Greek, word order doesn't really matter, okay? If you're wondering, ancient biblical Greek, word order doesn't matter. And sometimes these manuscripts have words in a slightly different order. Or an added word like John Mark instead of just the word John, telling you a little bit specifically more about who this person named John was. That's the sort of thing we have. 99.85% of these variants make zero difference for meaning and context in the Bible. So basically, what we have in front of us is what the, the early church had. Okay, nothing has changed. It's really amazing. But this 1% is what we're talking about this morning. This is one of two, or what we would call substantial additions to the text. Does anybody know what the other one is, by the way? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, dear goodness, I wrote it up. Okay, Mark. The answer is Mark. Did I put this? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, so the answer is Mark. There's an ending towards, if you guys want to know, when the book of Mark came out, Somebody lost the ending, and they're like, well, it just ends on a cliffhanger, and then they actually kind of summed up uh, the later resurrection appearances that they had in the other Gospels. They put it together, okay? So that's the other addition to uh, the Bible that we did not uh, have, okay? Other than that, these are the only two great additions in the Bible. Everything else is 
exactly the same, exact passages running exactly the same, uh, locations of everything exactly the same, sentence exactly in the same order from manuscript to manuscript to manuscript. It's very, very reliable. So now let's talk about John 8, 1 through 11. It's not in John early on. It comes in in the 4th century in John, but also somebody tosses it in in Luke, okay? They're like, "Eh, I don't know. Does this fit better in John or does this fit better in Luke? Okay, so they tried uh, both. It's undoubtedly a true story of what Jesus did. Okay, the early church fathers, writing in the first and second century, they reference this story. In particular, there's a guy named Papias, and Papias knew the apostle John, and Papias mentions this story. So it was known earlier on. It wasn't in our Bibles earlier on, but it was known in er- earlier on. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, it fits the memorized tradition of the, uh, the disciples. And, and what I mean is one of the jobs of the disciples, and it doesn't say this in the New Testament, but this is what all pupils of rabbis did in this day. If you were the pupil of a rabbi, what you committed to was memorizing all of their teaching and the instructive events of their life. You memorized it. And this is what the disciples did. This is what they would spend a lot of time doing is actually sitting and memorizing Jesus' teaching. And that material goes into Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, that's, that's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke read very similarly because they're, it's their shared memory that they force themselves to memorize, as all good pupils of rabbis do. And this story looks like it fits in there. Okay? This is a true story. It's what the disciples memorized, but it wasn't originally in John, and it wasn't originally in our Bible. And so for this reason, I'm uncomfortable of just preaching on this text. I want to preach from something that I know is scripture. And so John 3.17 is scripture. And I want to use John 3.17 and then look at this story and say, look, this is how this works. Okay. And so John 3.17, which should be behind us, I think. Is it behind us or did I do this wrong? Uh, Can we say it out loud? Are we all right to that? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is a wonderful statement of why Jesus, the Messiah, has come. He has come not to throw us into the dust, but to raise us up into life. Not to condemn us, but to give us life. Now, we're going to look at this story, which is a true story, but not necessarily fitting into Scripture, and we're going to see that that's exactly what takes place, okay? Mercy triumphs over justice. God hasn't sent Jesus to condemn, and Jesus doesn't condemn this woman and doesn't desire primarily, it's not his first prerogative to condemn people. He wants to save them. And so in now, returning to John 8, in verses 1 through 5, we see a very nasty trap set up, okay, from the religious leaders. They are trying to discredit and destroy Jesus. And so Jesus has got this huge group of people that are out in the courtyard of the temple and they're gathering around him and you can just see that they are very jealous and they want to stop this and they want to silence this man and so they drag this woman before Jesus as he's teaching and they say, teacher, hold on everybody, you just stop for a second, Jesus. Teacher, (laughs) this woman was caught in adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, it commands that we stone such a one. But what do you say? (laughs) Okay, what do you say? Moses says stone her. How about what you're going to tell us? Now, obviously, they think that Jesus does not want to condemn this woman to death. And there's a good reason for that. It's because Jesus has already forgiven prostitutes and drug addicts and tax collectors. The riffraff of society, Jesus has said, no, you are welcome in the kingdom of God, and we're not going to stone you. We're not going to take your lives. We're just going to, we're going to bring you in and show you mercy. And so they, they got this idea from somewhere. Because the leaders of that day said, if you did any of those things, you could never ever in a million years go to heaven. You ought to just die anyway right now. That's what ought to happen to you. So they already know that Jesus is not desiring to take this woman's life. But it's not like they care. This is just a stupid trap. Okay? And here's the trap. If Jesus says, yes, the law says condemn her, so let's go ahead and stone her. Let, I agree. Let's stone her together. Uh, then he's going to get in trouble with the Romans. Because, see, the Romans had taken over, and they said, you guys can't execute people. We're in charge here. You're not allowed to. And so if he does that, he then is going to be in trouble with Rome. They're going to say, that man is a rebel, and we need to put him to death. If, on the other hand, 
he says, guys, let's just be merciful here. They're like, do you even believe the scripture? No, you don't, Jesus. We caught you. You don't like the scriptures at all. So this is the trap. But something's very, very fishy, isn't this? There's two scriptures that are being alluded to here from the Torah, the first five books. Leviticus 20, verse 10, and Deuteronomy 22, 22. But what it says there, and it's important, we're going to deal with this in a second. It does say that adultery, which is committing uh, a sexual out outside of marriage with no intention of being married to that person, and, and maybe you're already married with somebody else, that adultery is punishable by death to both parties, both people, the man and the woman. But who do we have here? Who's, who's the only person here? We just got the woman. Where did the man go? Wait, wait, why didn't you guys bring everybody here that committed the crime rather than just this lady? What the, this is a bit fishy. And also, the other thing is we expect the parties that have been wrong to be there too. So that would be the husband that has been cheated on and on the other side, the wife that has been cheated on. Where are they? They're not to be seen. What's going on here that you've concocted this sort of scene now, we have to deal with the fact, and we've got to talk about this, that in the Bible, particularly in that first generation uh, of Jewish people that came out of Egypt, if you committed adultery, the biblical prohibition in Torah is death, the death penalty. Uh, and let me tell you, that, doesn't that just te feel terrible in our society? I mean, we really balk at anything in this area. It feels like we can't t say anything to anybody's area there. We can't tell them what, what they sh who they should and shouldn't sleep with. We can't tell them that they should stay married. Oh, whoa, what, what narrow-minded, terrible people we are to say such things as this. Um, I mean, marriage is, is becoming increasingly rare, to be honest. And cheating is considered a bit of naughty fun, isn't it? That, that's, you know, oh, what did you do? Huh, huh. Hopefully your spouse won't find out. Oh, that's funny. Um, how do we explain what's here? The first thing is that Israel has a stricter law than everybody else. And this is made clear by God. And the reason they have this strict law is because God wants Israel to represent himself to the world. And so because they have that special relationship, there's a special set of rules that they're living by that are not really for everyone else. Now, the moral principle is for everyone else. But the strictness of it is not from everyone else. But we're going to see that God ignores the strictness of it, too, in the Old Testament. Okay, but well, we'll get there in a second, okay? But then the second thing, and we really have to say this, is that morally the principle applies. It is far better to have a committed relationship where people have vowed to each other to stay together to not leave each other. That is far better than sowing your wild oats, getting on Tinder or Grinder or one of those other filthy things. Having relationships in which you cut the relationship off and move on to the next person, and, and, and you think that that's okay, but what it's doing is it's shooting any real relationship in the foot later. That's what's going on. If you practice unfaithfulness, then that's what you get at the end. This, we need to hear this as a society. The very best thing you can have is commitment. Uh, the Guardian has this section in it, and it's, it's a, this is how we do it is what it's called. And it's just all the different sexual behavior of the people who read The Guardian. And it, I feel so horrible that this section is, is there because, okay, you're interested in this. All right, I get it. You're interested in this. Well, if you want to have lots and lots of sex, if that's what you want, I'd like you to know that those who are married have twice as much as everybody else. So if that's interesting to you, go this direction. I mean, this is a blessing, guys. God is giving us the way of life, and this beautiful, committed relationship is where we find joy. I'm just, I just, I don't want anybody to hear judgment here, <laughs> okay? No judgment from me. God wants you to be free God wants you to be full of life. Last thing to say, in those other relationships, it's all about performance. If you don't perform, they go. But in a committed relationship, it's all about commitment. And it's just something that can be enjoyed. Okay, lots and lots of things to say here. I just want to encourage you. This is way in the deep zone of things I'm not supposed to talk about during church. But there we are. I want to commit to you guys. I want you, if you're, if you're not in a place where that's true for you, 
maybe in a moment you'll be able to pray a little prayer and say, God, I really would like to have a committed marriage with somebody uh, that you bring along to me. Okay, now let's move on. They think Jesus wants to show mercy, and they're not wrong. And this is the punchline. But what they miss is that the Old Testament, the Old Testament also wants to show mercy. They've got it wrong. They've got it completely and utterly wrong. How do I know that? There are a number of heroes of faith in the Old Testament. Do you know who they are? Judah. Have you guys heard of Judah? Hero of the Old Testament. Tamar was the person that he slept with that he shouldn't have. She's in the Old Testament as well. Rahab, she is a harlot, okay? She ends up in David's lineage. Uh, David and Bathsheba, they commit adultery together. They live on to contribute to the Messiah's lineage. The parents of Moses, they've committed a, uh, a sexual offense that is uh, supposed to claim their lives, They are not put to death, and thus we get Moses, and thus we get Torah. It seems like God has just put aside the law for these people. They don't get the death penalty that, quote, they do deserve. God puts it aside, and we ask, how is this possible? And this is is what it is. Um, It's the reformed heart. It's the repentant heart. When someone repents, sometimes God says, you get no consequences. You don't get your ultimate consequences. I remove it. And in this case, they didn't live up to the law of Moses, but there's a greater law. It's the law of faith that was given to Abraham, that one is justified by faith. And that is why God says, I put aside my law, the judgment thereof. And it turns out that Jesus is going to be the one that is punished for that. Jesus is going to take the punishment that we deserve. And so what this means is that they've read the Torah completely wrong and they've read the Old Testament completely wrong. The purpose of these books is so that God would turn you away from what would destroy you, give you grace, set you free to a new and different and beautiful life. That is his purpose. He wants you to live, not to be down in the dust, but to be raised up to life. Is everyone with me this morning? Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Remember our theme verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The second half of our story this morning is Jesus saving this woman's life. And let me tell you, it looks like she is going to die. I mean, this normally, the way this trickles out is one way or another, she's going to get stoned to death. But that's not what happens. Look at verse 6. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone from you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing still there. All right, now, the reason that this, uh, this actual story probably didn't make it into our Bibles is because nobody knows exactly what Jesus wrote, and it's just crazy the way that we elaborate about what he wrote. Maybe he, maybe he wrote down the plot line, you know, of what they were doing. You, plot, you concocted this whole thing, and he writes it down or whatever. Maybe, maybe he's trying to say, don't write in the mud like that and sling mud at one another. Or maybe he's quoting from Jeremiah where it says the sins of of the people are written down in the dirt. Which one is it? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And actually, it's really not that important. Part of what Jesus is doing is saying, let's just take our eyes off of this situation. And let's look down for a second. Let's let's just stop. Okay? (laughs) So part of that is going on. But what he does here is he essentially calls their bluff. Uh, He says, oh, you, you guys want to stone her? Okay, well, why did you come to me? If you want to stone her, go ahead, if you're, if you're without sin. Go ahead, go ahead, you go ahead. And they go, oh, no, no, Jesus, wait a minute. No, Jesus, we want you to stone her so that we can tell the Romans that that's what you do. Not for us to stone her, and then you tell the Romans that we did it, and we get in trouble. He said, we want you to get in trouble with the Romans, not us get in trouble with the Romans. And so he totally diffuses their trick. Now they're the ones that are guilty. They're the ones that are insisting she should die. Oh, really? You want to do that? Okay, if you're innocent, go ahead, met out justice. If you're innocent, go ahead, met out justice. Whoa, whoa, wait, we didn't think you meant that, Jesus. (laughs) Whoops. 
Now, Jesus means two things here. When he says, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So let's deal with that. The first thing is he's saying, don't judge others when you do the same thing yourself. You're not fit to be a judge because you do that very thing. That's the first thing he's saying. Matthew 7, we can just look at it real quickly. Let's just bounce over to Matthew. Matthew 7, important words to live, li live by. says this, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The, the, the hypocrisy of the leaders here is obvious. The crowd knows that they had to set this up, and they joined in a sense with what is going on. All to make Jesus look bad. They're guilty of the same things. Uh, whenever I judge somebody, I often find that I do the exact same thing a little later and judge myself. Um, the other day, uh, I was driving, and there was a person who was weaving through the roundabout. It just makes me so grumpy when people do this. Can't you figure out which way to go ahead of time, you silly people? Don't do that, you know? You're going to get an accident. And somebody did it, and I look over at my wife, and I'm like, what is this person doing? And she's like, be, be kind to that person. That's what she, be kind. Um, and then a little later, I was in a place I didn't know, and the roundabout snuck up on me. It snuck up on me. And so here I go, and, and all of a sudden, I'm trying to go this way, and, and Andrea's like, you're going to hit the car. And there was a person coming through, you see, and I, didn't, I just figured it was empty. I don't know if any of you have done that. And I just, and I just condemned this other lady, and I did the exact same thing. And, and this is really important for Christians, and we're going to get more into this when we get to toxic religiosity. When we say, you know what, I've done it, I've done it, and you are the guilty ones. Often it tends to be the thing that makes us most angry and most ready to judge someone else is something that has bothered our own conscience, something we're guilty of. Don't do it. Be merciful people. Be loving people. Be like Jesus. Goodness, he really is innocent, and yet he's going to give mercy here. Wow. So that's the first thing that he means. But the, the second thing, he, you'll notice he says, whoever uh, is innocent, let them be the first to throw the stone. That word first is important. Because what that meant is, if we're reading Torah, okay, if we're going back now to Torah, it actually says that when somebody is the wronged person in the relationship, so the cheated on person, that they would be first to throw the stone at the person who has committed adultery. Wow. Can you imagine that? That's your spouse, right? They're saying the spouse is going to throw the stone at the person who's committed adultery and kill them to start the process. That's terrifying. And I think, by the way, it's, uh, it, uh, maybe I'm wrong on this, but my thought about that is actually that's God's way of saying, actually, the person who has found out that somebody has cheated, they then have a chance to show mercy. And they do what Joseph did. Remember that Mary, they, that Joseph thought that Mary was pregnant, outside of uh, their relationship. They hadn't uh, uh, come together yet. And he wanted to put her away secretly because he feared the Lord and uh, knew the scriptures. Okay, So he, he said, no, 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 that's not what I want. And so this is God saying, be merciful, actually. You have an opportunity for mercy here. But, but nevertheless, Jesus is like, hey, where are those first people? Where is that husband that was crossed or that spouse that I don't see them that person should be the one that goes first so what you got guys where 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 is that spouse I mean this is starting to seem like it kind of concocted this I mean did you pay someone to go have sex a man and then pull that person and then just take the woman and bring her here and make this big scene I mean that's horrible and now everybody is thinking that too and so now the leaders are backtracking because they don't want to get caught in their sin. Oh, whoops. We went too far here. Oh, and it turns out that we don't give one rip about what's in the Torah. <laughs> we just care about being right and getting rid of Jesus. And so what happens is they get up from the oldest to the youngest and they leave. Well, why did they do that? Well, technically you would think that the oldest had the most sins, but it's also, it's a cover technique. They can't say the first person that left. Actually, that, one's, that was the guy who planned this. <laughs> Those are the guilty people. 
and they leave the woman alone. Listen, this is probably the only situation in which she gets to live. If Jesus has found the way to bring her life. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What do we get from this sermon? Let's see what Jesus says here. Verse 10. And then we'll have some closing thoughts. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. And neither do I condemn, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sins. So uh, also in the Torah, you needed two witnesses to verify that this was actually a crime in order to convict somebody. And so since they've all left now, Jesus is like, well, we don't have a quorum here, so I guess I'm not joining. <laughs> See you later. You're out. You're, You're free. You're free to go. Now close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to think of the worst thing that you have ever done. Don't say it out loud. Think of the worst things you have ever done. And I want you to think of that moment when you are in the middle of it and you're thinking, actually, this is a terrible place to be. And you open your eyes and there you are in a courtroom. And God is there. And so are people accusing you and saying, this person deserves to die for what they have done. And God looks over at you and he says, I do not condemn you. And you walk free. If you are a Christian, this is not make-believe. This is the reality of your life. Your sins are before God. He has every business to throw you into hell. But he chooses mercy. I do not condemn you either. Go free in Christ. Why? Because Christ will be punished. Christ will die for us. He will, he will take our penalty on his back. He will be the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world and we will walk away clean and free. It is a beautiful thing. It is the reality. We are the woman, you see. That's the punchline. You are the adulterer. And God has set you free. Well, that is if you believe, if you repent, if you turn towards him. Now, let's not skip the end here. Jesus says to her, go and leave your life of sin. Go and leave your life of sin. Leave your drug addiction. Leave your pornography. Leave your Tinder. Leave your sleeping around. Leave your alcohol abuse. You have been set free. Now go and do something completely different. And I don't want anybody to hear judgment this morning. From me, this isn't a story about judgment. This is a story about freedom. <laughs> And some of you, drug addiction, pornography, alcohol abuse, living uh, with relationships that you should not be having. And some of you are like, you know what, today needs to be a day of freedom where I just walk out of this. And you're going to say that in a prayer in just a moment. <laughs> okay.